Uh, I think it's more just a lot of my work is pretty observational. And I'm from California and the West Coast, and I really never traveled outside of that until I went to grad school and I drove across the country and noticed the different architecture in California. California has its own, uh, LA has its own architectural styles, San Francisco has its own architectural styles, but where I grew up was actually pretty boring for architecture, kind of a pretty small agricultural town in California. And so actually being able to expand and go to cities like New York for the first time or go into the Midwest the next time and see the progression of that architecture, uh, the styles, the ornamentation that really didn't exist in my life for 20 something years of my life. I would have never seen much of that except maybe in the Bay Area. Um, and experiencing that and then also going to Europe for the first time and understanding how that Western ideas of architecture have made its way over to the US over time. And the US has its own progression as well um, as you go from the East Coast where um, uh, colonies kind of started. And as you go further west, that architecture almost like dissipates um, uh, just because of how resources might have existed from one area to another area. So that's how I kind of got interested in architecture and uh, uh, in the most basic sense, like I know very little about architecture, um, but I like getting into buildings. I, I, you, you can sense that as you walk into a building that's designed typically for our human bodies. And so they're always thinking about that. Even in factories, it doesn't have to be like some great architectural moment or some like great building, but every kind of building that you walk into is meant to um, house the body. Our bodies have our own architecture from a spine going uh, that holds us up going down to our feet and we touch the ground. And all of those things have to be considered in architecture. And like I kind of said, this uh, the exhibition itself, everything is, it's not light, it's not heavy work, but it's pretty heavy work. Like even the vinyl pieces weigh an amount. Glass is a very, very heavy material and being bounded by um, lead is something that uh, requires both malleability and also structure to it. And I think that's kind of what we are as we um, interact with buildings and architecture. And the ornamentation, again, is just a lack of it in my life and going and seeing it for the first time. I probably thought New York City was like, or Chicago was amazing. And then you go to Europe and then there's even the next level of that and that craft, um, that idea of um, crafting these, uh, the ornamentation on buildings, but also um, what that labor is and where it comes from, the difference of the uh, craft coming from a European kind of style to an American style is very different as well. Yeah, the kind of socioeconomic ties um, through ornamentation, I mean, typically, I mean, I, I've looked and researched and used uh, the height of those uh, social and economic um, pinpoints in our history. Like Versailles is something that you can really look at uh, both visually and historically, especially where we are in America right now. Uh, people got their heads cut off because <laughs> they were accumulating and hoarding materials and, uh, and expressing what they had through uh, opulence. And um, that's not exactly the only purpose of ornamentation, um, a lot of it is to give something stature, not necessarily opulence or kind of an accumulation or hoarding, but um, my specific upbringing, I was, um, grew up in a town that was pretty agricultural, pretty small, um, a town called Lodi, California. And um, both my parents were just public school educators and so when I think about it, and, and there wasn't a whole lot of wealth in the city that I grew up with, it was uh, a lot of 
immigrants and a lot of uh, factory workers, a lot of uh, people picking in the fields and growing up around that really, uh, it really kind of affected the way that I look at the world. And ornamentation is again, typically used for to raise a place up, whether it's religion or whether it is kind of like a state building or uh, any kind of architectural type of building. The demarcations that it has, it marks a spot typically. Um, it tells you you are in a very specific uh, realm or actually like a very specific world. The lack of ornamentation um, on buildings marks certain ideas of like modernism. And so like but typically what I try to do with that ornamentation is kind of jam those together quite a bit and layer and stack those to make the kind of point that maybe uh, we don't put a lot of ornamentation on buildings anymore. I know why, but I also want other people to kind of question why. Where did that kind of come from? Um, and as you see it in certain spots and in certain buildings, you want people to kind of question why that does or doesn't exist. Um, I also think it's just beautiful, you know? I mean, it, it exists for its beauty, and I try to make works that have, um, if not beauty, the approximation of beauty. And so I use that as a way to kind of uh, tack these on and make relationships between the materials that some of them are kind of blank, like I would consider the vinyl material relatively blank material. Um, glass itself, I guess, is kind of a blank material and wood, but the way that I try to manipulate that, I, I really try to um, incorporate a lot of those ideas of um, all of their kinds of uses, whether they're utilitarian uses or whether they do become these objects of, build, of beauty that do begin to like signify where you are in the world, uh, not just as like location, but as a human being in a huge spectrum of, of what we are socially and politically. Yeah, I love digging into materials. I love finding uh, new processes and new materials. Uh, I've always kind of been a woodworker, woodworker. I, my dad and I built really bad shelves all the time. That's how I still build a lot of my uh, structures and um, but over time I've been able to kind of gain certain skills of these things and it really is like I, I really like picking up new skills in relationship to the new materials as well like finding the vinyl material itself it is something that um, you sit on uh, it's uh, it's more of like a surface kind of material and to take that material and deny that surface and show a new surface by cutting it into a bunch of strips. I'm, I'm kind of exposing the material for what it is. And I think that's kind of what I do in some of these other pieces, but I'm also, I think, obfuscating that material as well. I think in uh, the cast resin pieces where I'm making my own aggregate, um, those aggregates are coming from uh, places that I do live or have lived in the past. Uh, I'm using Colorado Red Rock sandstone. I'm using um, iron oxide black sand from the San Joaquin Delta where I'm from. I'm using Colorado Google marble. And I'm, uh, there are a lot of processes that break those things down and I'm attempting to kind of reconstitute it into uh, a new material or uh, an approximation of an object that might already exist. But it's something that I, I, it's very new to be casting and making these up of my own aggregates, but at the same time, they're, um, I don't know, they, they begin to hold a new meaning through new material and a new process um, through a language that I've already built in this ornamentation. Uh, I would say that the glass itself is, uh, that process is, the, the traditional lead stained glass process has been around for a thousand, over a thousand years. Um, I 
and something that moved over from Europe and came over to America. It typically exists in, uh, typically it was almost always a religious uh, tool in order to uh, interpret God as light passing through into a church. And so with that, uh, light, I, I feel like I'm kind of subverting that material a little bit by making it an opaque black glass, something that you can't see through that is denying that light coming through in the same way that I would kind of deny the surface of the vinyl material in order to make those pieces and reveal something kind of new. And I think I'm kind of flipping with the cast pieces. I feel like I'm kind of flipping the idea of this relatively, you know, some of them are extractive processes. The, the mining of, of uh, the marble is an extractive process. Um, and I'm kind of jamming that with the process of how our natural environment actually breaks down. Um, red rocks uh, and a lot of uh, stone, the elements will break that down into either smaller rocks or in the case of some of the material I'm using, uh, the kind of red piece over here, it's a very fine dust because over probably millions of years, water and wind has kind of accumulated it. It's so, it's like, it's almost like a choppy kind of dust. It's almost like a clay kind of dust. So I think I'm uh, kind of thinking about the process the natural process of something breaking down and then us kind of extracting kind of marble from um, from uh, the mountains that we have. Yeah, I let's see, my studio practice is regimented only in the sense that I'm there six or seven days a week. Um, and the way that materials come, there's some things that are very constant in my studio. Obviously, like the upholstery vinyl is extremely constant. It typically comes in these 30 yard rolls that are weighing like 60 or 70 pounds. They have their own place. That's another way of kind of accumulating material and accumulating color and accumulating uh, embodied color itself. And those are always kind of the anchor point because I've been making them for about 10 years, 12 years now. And those anchor really the way I think about other materials and gather other materials. It's really um, that accumulation of the rolls and the stacking of rolls is the same way that um, architectural foam kind of cheap trim molding comes in a box. It comes horizontal, um, it's all stacked on top of each other. Um, it's the same way that if you go and look at glass, uh, stained glass in a warehouse. It's kind of like stacked in a way in rows and like in perfect order. And um, to some degree, I feel like breaking up that perfect order uh, is one of my methods of, of making and, and breaking down materials. Um, so in the studio, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> but I don't know, it, it, it helps me both force new things that I'm interested in. Again, whether it's like painting or whether it's collage, um, whether it's casting this material, whether it's stained glass. Um, I do have a couple separate studio spaces, but I always bring them when they're finished pieces into the studio so that I can like live with them and try to make sure that, actually, I don't care about making sure if they are totally related. Um, it's probably more about color relation, figuring out the uh, how they, work in the space that way. How the rolls of vinyl, which are always a uh, singular monocolor kind of stack on top of each other. Um, and then as I break those down and make color and palette choices with, you know, these vinyl pieces, um, they'll begin to influence the way I make collages in that specific time. Even if it's a totally uh, a different studio space. Um, making that trim to piece. I was like, well, I think I want like a, a lot of blue is actually going on in my studio. That's why these pieces are here. That's why um, I was kind of casting those, um, the uh, silicone medallions in that kind of blue because I was thinking about that piece and the kind of blue that would be there and then also the blue that would be in a vinyl piece. 
So they all kind of connect in that way. And it just takes being in the studio, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day for you either to become, uh, I don't know, psychologically imbued with them, <laughs> becoming a maniac about the colors or, uh, or having a certain mania or fervor about um, specific works that kind of build off of each other, not just the way that I process them, but color choice, the gravity, even the size of them are all uh, uh, related to each other. You know, this gets into art gallery world stuff, but it's like, I have some of my galleries will want the vinyl works just to sell them to show off, you know, on a PDF. And I'm like, I would please, I want them to be shown before you sell, before they get whisked away and they never see them again. And so there is that kind of attachment because I, I enjoy making them. I enjoy putting them out there and, and having a reaction and, and using them as a way to, again, put other works in relationship to them because they, as important as the untitled final series is, the other works are extremely important to me too. And I, I want those to be shown in the same light. I'm not trying to like raise one up to the other because the process, like it's making these has become uh, a very specific process and everything else is not specific to me. I'm still figuring them out. And I hold that, uh, investigation pretty high in relation when they are finished uh yeah i'm happy to send them out to the world <laughs> and i do do i remember every single one i think that's funny because it's uh if someone brings it up they're like this one is like okay i don't remember what show that one was in but i think it's because of having an exhibition and putting them out there in the world that's how i can remember more of the mark of time where they might get lost if they were just kind of like whisked off to somewhere and I've, it's pretty funny. I mean, I rarely get to see them in situ, like they're installed, they get sold, maybe eventually some, you know, person who, uh, the collector themselves or someone who helped them, uh, do the interior of their place. Like I'll see it and I'll be like, okay, I remember that piece. I remember when that was, and it is a really nice marker to have something that consistent. There, there are pieces that of, like I've made enough black pieces that are kind of similar to this, but they're all so wholly unique in a way where um, it's either the specific rhythm or cadence of the piece is different and the width of the actual uh, distance between the gaps between the two uh, colors, or I'm using a different color in between um, different shades of white, it's almost like cream, like this one, it's probably hard to tell, but this is actually way more of like a beige color in between them than like a pure white. And they would make a huge difference, even if it were the same rhythm of them. Uh, the white would pop so much harder versus that black versus this one, which is more uh, some of the beiges and that kind of white piece over there. And so I think these might actually be the same length and front cut from the same one. It's like, um, and I wanted to use more of that beige in this black one. And so, yeah, I can talk about all of them in a very, very specific way, even though I've made so many of them, but there are always kind of new shapes and new patterns that um, are maybe not infinite, but um, constantly giving back to me and back to my studio in a way that is uh, energetic for me. I'm hoping that they have, I don't know about specific words, but I'm hoping they have a lot of different words that they kind of have to construct and deconstruct themselves. How much do you want them to investigate? How much do you want to confuse them? How much do you want to um, lead them along? I'm trying to figure out the language too, the bio language here, because a lot of the work is like super new. This is only the second stained glass piece I made, really. Uh, these two are first the real aggregate ones that were relatively successful after a few small tests. Uh, and building a show like this is fun and kind of difficult at the same time. Um, but I am I'm trying to lead the audience in a way where uh, I'm using color as a connection, as both a connection and also a disconnection too. 
if there's a, if there's a different material um, and a different process of using uh, or, or a different outcome of the object, I want them to be like, okay, well, I understand that these are both white and they're near each other. They both kind of bend. They both are kind of like flexible. They have this flexibility to them. Um, I, I want them to be almost forced to uh, think about how those two pieces are relating to each other. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for the installers. Maybe not easy for the audience, but uh, that's that's the exhibition I enjoy going into, and especially at an opening and uh, with writing with materials, uh, writing materials that exist in the gallery. I hope that. that uh, opens it up enough for them, but also gives them enough boundaries too. Like, I don't think any of this work is open to interpretation at all, really. It's really not, it's like very specific. Even the abstract works are very specific to uh, gravity, to weight, to repetition, to the body, uh, to the way the materials kind of like slump over each other. Some of them are a little more stiff than others and some of them are very kind of floppy and, uh, and malleable, but uh, I really hope that an audience would come into the show with, a, uh, with curiosity coming into it of the objects, even if they have to question how they're made, what they're made of. I think that that is a good way to lead people into it and then to expose them to um, what I consider a lot of these objects and very invented. They aren't, they're referential in some parts, but uh, some are a little more referential than others. But I have a curiosity when I'm working with the materials. And I hope that the audience would see that curiosity in how they're made, why they're made, why they're taking reference from the limitation. What is that rhythm? What is that repetition? Um, and how, how does that exist in our lives? In our own bodies, and what we wear, and what we walk, our routines, uh, and the spaces that we 